So I'm interested in barn owls, as I said, but what motivates me is not the zoological interest, uh, is not mainly the zoological interest, but mainly the, 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 the curiosity to understand uh, how these machines work, okay? how the brain works. And my research in my lab is part of the research field that's called neuroscience, uh, which is the uh, international scientific quest to try and understand how the brain works. And there are some people that say that this is the, the, the most, uh, the, the, the major challenge, uh, the major scientific challenge that humanity is faced today, understanding how the brain works. I, it, it's arguable, I will not tell you my opinion. Uh, I will just tell you that I think that in order to, to, to really start dealing with this question, first of all, you have to define what is this question. Okay? What, what, what are you asking yourself, basically? Because you can research the brain at many different levels. You can study the, the molecular level, you can study the cellular level, you can study the network level, you can study the whole, the, the whole structure, or you can study the behavioral level. Okay? So what are you expecting to answer here? Okay? And I think the first thing that, that a researcher should do before answering this question is to ask himself, what is the function of the brain? Why, why is it there? Okay. And I think here the answer is quite clear. It's not uh, arguable that brain evolved through evolution to control the behavior of animals in their natural environments, behavior that becomes com complicated and com more and more complicated. So I believe that a level of research that we should study, at least at some point, is a level that is above the molecular level or the cellular level. Right? It's a level that combines biology and behavior. Right? And this research field is called behavioral neuroscience, or a better name, I prefer the name neuroethology. Okay? So in my mind, understanding the brain is to understand, for example, a maneuver such as this. Okay? Okay? If we can understand how this kite can identify it, its, its, its very uh, uh, small maneuvers of its companion, right? and how can it react to these small maneuvers, and how can it respond uh, correctly, and how can all its muscles work together in perfect harmony in time and space to create this, this beautiful uh, and smooth motion. Okay. If we can understand that, we can understand the brain. Okay. If we can understand the brain, of course, we can also treat the brain better in brain diseases, and we maybe be able better to, uh, we can improve the way we build behaving machines like robots and computer algorithms. So we, we, we decided what level we want to study the brain, but now we need to decide what model system we need. Okay? Every scientist has to have a model system to start his research. Okay? And I found this quote, which I think is, 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 is correct and smart, while humans are good for generating hypotheses, animals are good for t testing them. Okay? And therefore, we choose to study an animal which is not a human. And which animal shall we study? Um, well, there are a few options among the common laboratory animals. But one thing that we need, because we're studying neuroethology, we need an animal that uh, enables us to study both physiology and behavior, and enables us to do it in the lab, so we can raise this animal in the lab. It is important to be in the lab because with the technology we have today, it is very difficult to measure physiology in the field. And then another question that he asks, do we choose an animal that is a specialist or an animal that is a generalist? And what do I mean by this? Um, a specialist is an animal that evolved through evolution to, to, to a, to sit in a certain niche, okay? It's specialized for something. For example, if we want to study the auditory system or hearing, we choose an animal that is specialized for listening. For, it, it uses the auditory system for its survival, right? And if we want to study the somatosensory system, then we will not choose an animal that is very good at seeing, but we'll choose an animal that's very good at, at, at feeling the, the surrounding with its, its body, and, or, or we can use a, a rodent that feels the surrounding with its raw, uh, whiskers. And to illustrate the difference between an, a, a specialist and a generalist, uh, I brought this slide. So it's clear, if you're interested in, in technology of speed, you would not choose the Fiat Uno, you would choose this, this sport car, a Lamborghini or a Ferrari, I don't know. And the barn owls are the Ferrari of the auditory system in the animal, in the animal kingdom. So I choose the barn owl. <coughs> 
And this slide uh, demonstrates the specialization of the barn owl. This is a famous picture. It was taken probably about 40 years ago. And what you see here, you see here a barn owl uh, doing what it's good in, catching its prey, which is this little mouse. It's uh, flying, swooping from above, catching the mouse. But what's special about this picture, it was taken in the lab in complete darkness. It was used, the camera is using a light that the barn owl is not sensitive to. So he's not seeing anything, he's not seeing the mouse. Uh, but still, he catch it quite easily. And he is using his auditory system. Okay? And he's, he's listening. Okay? And, how, and what is more interesting for us about the barn owl, that unlike other animals that hunt in the dark, like bats, the barn owl is not using a sonar system. He's using passive hearing, passive listening, just like we do. He's just using the sounds that this mouse is making while running along the floor. Okay? And how do we know that? And this is an easy experiment that was done. Uh, you can tie a string to the uh, tail of the mouse and at the other side of the string attach a newspaper. Okay? And what happens is that in most cases the barn owl will attack the newspaper and not the mouse. Okay? So it's not sonar, it's not hearing, it's not smelling. It's the sounds that, they, uh, that are making. It's a passive listening. So this remarkable capability was identified by a very, very good an important neuroscientist, name of Marco Nishi, and he identified the potential of using the barn owl as a model system to solve a very important question at the time, and that is how can we identify where the sounds are coming from by using uh, uh, sounds that are coming to two ears. Okay? The, the answer was not clear at that time. And he brought the barn owl into the lab, actually made, the, made from the barn owl a laboratory animal and basically funded this field and started a very successful research uh, which provide many interesting insights and today we know quite well how barn owls and also how we localize sounds. Um, I will not talk about this today, I will talk about other things um, just to say that there are now about, not about, there are exactly eight laboratories in the world that study barn owls and our lab in the Technion is one of them. <coughs> Um, so now what I want to do is I want to describe a few adaptations that are special for the barn owl that allow the barn owl to do this behavior that I've shown you. Okay? It's not all of the adaptation, but it's just some of them. So first of all, the barn owl and oh, many owls have this round face. Okay? And why they have this round face is because they have these, uh, they have these very strong and thick feathers uh, all around the face. And these feathers, they, um, they retract sound waves. Okay? So basically, the whole face is like a big funnel. It funnels the, the, the sound waves into the ear canals, okay? just like our external ear, but it's just the whole face. And you don't see those ca canals because the face is covered with the fluffy feathers. Okay? These are feathers that allow sounds to pass through. And in this picture, what you see is a drawing of a barn owl without these fluffy feathers. So you can see these thick feathers and they, they kind of divide the head into two parts. Okay? And you see here, here's an, a, one canal and here's the other canal. And then you have these ear flaps. Uh, these are just some, some skin tissue. And behind these are the opening of the ear canals. Okay? So it's one on the right side and one on the left side. And what is immediately jumped to the eye is that this is not a symmetrical face. Okay? Um, there are differences in the positioning of the opening, and there's also differences of the positioning of these skin flaps. Okay? And what this makes, it makes one ear to be more sensitive to sounds coming from above, and the other ear to be more sensitive to sounds coming from below. Okay? And this is very important because it helps the owl resolve or, or, or decide at what position in the elevation the sound is. Okay. And w can you try and guess which ear would be more sensitive to sounds coming from above? The right ear? That's correct, the right ear because of the opening up here. See, it's a larger opening here, and here's a smaller opening. <coughs> Another adaptation we can find in the feathers. And the wing feathers, uh, this is a, fe uh, a feather of a barn owl, and this is a feather of a pigeon. 
And what you can see is that if you look at the microscope, you'll see that the edge of the feathers here in the pigeon are smooth, and here there's this comb-like structure. And this is basically a silencer, a sound silencer. If, when pigeons fly, they make a lot of noise. If you've been in, 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 uh, in Europe, in, in, in the main cities, you probably hear it a lot. When barn owls fly, it's completely silent. And that is because they have this special structure. And why is this adaptation for listening? Because uh, when the owls fly, they, it's quiet, so they can hear the sounds from the surrounding. The flying, the flapping of the wing do not mask the, the hearing of the barn owl. And then, the last and most important adaptation, we can see if we look inside the brain. So what you see here is a slice through an area in the brain which is called the tecta lobe in a barn owl up here and in a pigeon down here. And what you see here, it says IC, which means inferior colliculus. Inferior colliculus is the, the most important auditory nucleus, one of the most important auditory nuclei in the brain. Okay. It, uh, it, it processes auditory information. And you can see the borders of this nucleus here in the barn owl and in the pigeon. In the pigeon, it's much, it is much smaller. Okay. That's true for all the auditory pathways in the barn owl's brain which means that the auditory signals in the barn owl's brain are much more robust, are much more large. The auditory pathways are much more large. The anatomy is, is, is much more robust. It's much easier to identify these pathways, to follow them, and to do the research, to, to, to solve all the questions about how they work. And this is one of the main reasons why the barn owl has been such a successful model system. OK, so as I said, <coughs> We're looking for an animal that we can do also behavioral experiment. And what you see is a picture from a behavioral experiment or a psychophysical experiment that we do with a barn owl. And this barn owl is a trained barn owl. It was raised from a young age with humans, so he's not afraid of, of humans. He's used to us. And he's trained to stand on this uh, uh, perch at the center of a dark and quiet room. And every time there is a sound, a brief sound from the speaker, it needs to turn its gaze to look at the speaker. And if he's doing it satisfactorily, then he gets some reward from this straw that you see here, some food. Okay? And what you see here, this string that is attached to its head, this string is attached to a small coil. Okay? And the whole room is inside a magnetic field that is uh, changing, changing magnetic field. So every time the coil is switching its orientation inside the magnetic field, there is an electric a car, a current that is induced in, in the wire. And then we can record these electrical uh, 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 currents. So we can tell what is the orientation of the barn owl's head. We can tell if the barn owl is looking correctly or what is the error of the barn owl. Okay? And now when I uh, once showed this picture in a, in, in a lecture, one of the, the people said, what are you doing to this poor barn owl? Why are you twisting its head like this? So don't be alarmed. We're not twisting its head. Barn owls uh, have very flexible uh, head, remarkably flexible head, and this is just a natural behavior. The barn owl here is very interested in the camera that is taking, uh, which we, uh, taking its picture, and therefore it's checking it from very different angles. So <coughs> these kinds of experiments are classical experiments. They've been done in the lab of Marco Nishi, uh, uh, and also we, we do it now. Uh, also today, but what Mark Konishi and his student did, they um, used exactly this kind of experiment to measure the uh, localization error of the barn owl. Okay, and here you see uh, one of those classical graphs. What you see here is the position of the speaker relative to the barn owl's head, that is the azimuth of the stimulus. And what you see here is the turning angle of the barn owl. Okay. So you can measure here uh, the, the position and the turning ahead. You can measure all kinds of parameters here. And also what you can do, you can, from time to time, you can switch, not use an external speaker, but use earphones. Okay. And the advantage of earphones is that you can use a computer to, to control the sounds and, and, and change all kinds of parameters in the sound. You can manipulate the time differences between the two ears, the time intensities. You can manipulate frequencies. So you can do all these kinds of, of tricks. 
And if you do it smartly and systematically, you can basically use these kinds of experiments to expose what are the localization cues in the sound. That is, what cues in the sound are used by the barn owl brain to extract the information where the sound is. Okay? Because you want to try and see if you change something, can you trick the barn owl to look somewhere else? And, 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 and this has been done very thoroughly, and we now know uh, probably all the localization cues that barn owls are using. Uh, I will mention only two. One of them is the time difference between the arrival of the sounds to the two ears. This is called the interaural time difference, or ITD. The other <coughs> is, the in, is the differences in the level of the sounds between the two ears, which is called the interaural level difference, or the ILD. And I will uh, focus more on the ITD. And the, 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 the principle is very simple. Basically, if you have a sound source just in front, then the distance to the two ears is equal. Okay? So the sound will arrive at two ears at the same time, okay? and therefore we have an ITD of zero. Okay? Now, if we take the sound source and move it slightly to the right, okay? the distance to the right ear is now shorter than the distance to the left ear. The sound will arrive at the right ear before it will arrive at the left ear, so we get an ITD that is larger than zero. Okay? And if we take the sound source further away, the ITD will increase until it reaches a maximum right here at 90 degrees. Okay? Yes? Uh, how would the barn owl know if, uh, if the ITD is zero? How would it know if it's right in front or right at the back? Okay, that's a very good question. Uh, and the answer is that it's not only using ITD for sound localization, it has other cues, okay, which help him to resolve exactly these, 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 these problems. Okay? But I will not go in, with details into this. Um, now, uh, of course, you can imagine that because sound travels pretty fast, okay, and the head is pretty small, uh, this, could, this should be very small time differences. Okay? And indeed, they are in the order of tens of microseconds. Okay? And uh, Mark Konishi and his students showed, managed to show that the barn owl brain actually can measure these small time differences. Uh, the smallest time differences is probably between 5 to 10 microseconds that the barn owl's brain can measure, or can tell the difference, and that is quite remarkable. Okay? So now, this raises two main questions, two main questions, two very interesting and important questions. And the first one okay, is how the brain measures ITD, given that these are such small quantities, such small uh, time differences. Okay? And this question has been studied a lot. And we have some quite good ideas how this can be done. Um, <coughs> I will not talk about this today. I want to talk about today about the second question, which, which is how the brain matches an ITD value to a position in space. Okay. And what do we mean by this question? Let's say we already solved the first problem. Okay? We have a brain that can measure ITD very, very precisely. But still, this is not enough to tell us where the sound is coming from. Okay? Because let's say we measure an ITD of 100 microseconds. Okay? So where is it? We know it's to the right. But is it 10 degrees to the right, 45 degrees to the right, or, or 90 degrees to the right? Okay? We have to know. So this is, a, this is, this is called the... Uh, um, this is called the matching problem. This is the problem of calibration. Okay? We have to calibrate the system. And this problem becomes even more complicated because it's not the, 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 this uh, matching, this mapping between ITD and the space is not something that is stable. This is something that is dynamic. It, it can change. First of all, if we have a, have a smaller barn owl with a small hand, head, an ITD of 100 microseconds would mean a, a sound source that is further to the right than for a barn owl with a larger head. Okay. And also, this depends on all kinds of parameters, like the ear structure, um, the, 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 the transduction of sounds in the ear, how fast information is, 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 is transmitted from the ear to the brain. Okay. So all these parameters can change with age, and it can be different from one barn owl to another. Okay. So the barn owl must have, and not only the barn owl, also we, we must have some mean to calibrate our system, to adjust the system. And how this is done? 
Well, the answer is that it is done through experience. Okay? We experience the world through our own ears, and somehow this experience goes back into the brain, change the brain, so that it adjusts the brain to behave normally, to behave correctly. Okay? And this kind of changing the brain, changing the brain is, 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 is learning. Okay? And this kind of learning is called experience-dependent plasticity. We learn through experience. And the question of how experience-dependent plasticity is achieved in the barnard brain has been the main research question in the lab where I did my postdoc, the lab of Eric Knudsen in Stanford University. There we mostly studied experience-dependent plasticity by manipulating the senses. And for example, sticking an earplug into one ear, letting the owl adjust to it and see what's happened to the brain. Or another manipulation is shown here. Here you can see young barn owl <coughs> that is wearing spectacles. Right? And the spectacles are prismatic spectacles. Okay? That is, they shift the image, okay, the visual image, they optically shift the visual image into one direction at a certain angle. And since the barn owl's eyes are stable in its head, they cannot move our, their eyes like we do, okay? this manipulation results with a shift of the whole image on the retina of the eye. And as a result, a shift of the whole image in the brain. So the question is, if we let an owl roam free with these spectacles, what will happen to its behavior and what will happen to its brain? Okay. And again, you probably raise an eyebrow because we started by talking about the auditory system. Okay. And here I'm showing you a manipulation of the visual system. So how is this connected? And what I will show you now that it is very much connected. Um, this slide demonstrates the result of this classical experiment. And basically, in the experiment, the, I, they used trained barn owls that are, were trained to turn their gaze to targets, which could be either lights in the room or sounds from speakers in the room. And the owls were trained, so they do that quite well. Now they put the prisms in front of the owls, and they check their behavior. And what they find <coughs> is that now the owls, they don't turn their gaze to where the light is, obviously, what we expect. They turn their gaze to where they see the light is coming from, which is optically shifted by the prisms. Okay? This is a good sign. It means that the prisms are working. And also, as expected, the owls keep turning their gaze towards the sound source. Remember, this is in complete darkness. Okay? So they can't see the speaker, and they, they just hear it. The spectacles do not interfere with the uh, travel of sound to the ears, so they localize it well. That's all expected. Now, the owls are released in their cages, in their aviaries. They are allowed to interact with their fellow barn owls, to eat and do what they do in their normal life, but all the time they wear these prismatic spectacles. After a few weeks, they returned to the lab and checked again. And now the results are shown here. So, the owls now continue turning their gaze towards the light, just like they did the first day of wearing prismatic spectacles. Right? So, um, interestingly, this kind of manipulation had no effect or very little effect on their visual behavior, okay, and the visual localization. However, it had a dramatic effect on their auditory localization, as demonstrated here. Now the owls turn to a position in space which uh, was exactly predicted by the prisms, that is, the, in the direction and the angle of prismatic shift. Okay? So remarkably, they turn their gaze to a sound source as if it was a light source. Okay? Yes? Why do you think they were in the auditory system was adapted over the visual system? I mean, they could have adapted the visual system as well. Okay, but, but we will, I, I will discuss this more later and then maybe we can, we can talk about it, okay? Because this is exactly what I'm, I'm going to talk about now. Uh, <coughs> so it, it's, it's kind of surprising, and the reason it is surprising is because we expect when we, we do some manipulation to an animal, we expect that after a few weeks, the animal will adjust to it. That is, it will be able to um, correct errors. 
Okay? But here we see the opposite. Not only that it did not correct the visual error, it also acquired an auditory error. So it seems unintuitive. But if you think about it more, it is intuitive because when we turn our gaze to a sound source, what we want, we want to acquire the, 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 the source that produced the sound, we want to acquire it at the center of our visual system, the center of our, our eyes. And this is exactly what the owls are doing here. Okay? They're, learning, they're turning the gaze so that they can see what produces the sound. Okay? And this is an, a very elegant solution to the matching problem. And the solution is, that we see from here, is that the visual system is teaching the auditory system the calibration, where to look, what are the, the connections between the ITD values and the location in space. Because you see here, here and here, the ITD value that the owl measure was the same. Okay? But between this time and this time, the owl learned to acquire new positions for the same ITD values. Okay? And this he learned by the visual system. And for this, what the owl needs, the owl and also we need, he needs to be uh, in a rich environment where there are many, many sensory stimuli, but most important that there are many stimuli where you have objects that you can both see and hear. Okay? And you can connect between them. For example, barn owls flapping the wings, or, uh, uh, well, flapping the wind, I just mentioned that they're quiet, so it's not a good example, but mice walking on the floor, or people speaking. We, want, we need to see a lot of these uh, uh, objects so we can calibrate our auditory system. Uh, yes, the question. Well, first of all, I didn't say that. I never said that they hear better than they see. But I said that they're very good at hearing. So I said that maybe they, better, they hear better than you hear, but they don't hear better than they see. And it makes a lot of sense that the visual system is the system that is dominant, that teaches the auditory system, even in barn owls, because the visual system is, first of all, is very accurate in localizing. It's very easy to, lo to localize with the visual system. It's much more complicated than with the auditory system. Uh, and also, uh, the visual system is probably b more stable. Okay, localization in the visual system because it's a direct, uh, 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 the, the localization in the visual system is directly coming from the retina, from the position of the stimulus in the retina. It's like a, a back of a camera or a CCD camera. Okay? So it's very stable, the localization. In the, the auditory system, it depends on, on many things. Uh, the acoustic properties of the head can change and things can change. So, so it makes a lot of sense, I think, that the visual system is more dominant. Yes? Prisms. Yes. Uh, when, for example, you try to eat in the food, only when you see it, in that way. why it doesn't cons concentrate for it? For that one? Yeah, okay, oh, is also a very good question. So, <coughs> he, he, oh, the owl has, has their prisms, okay, and now they need to eat. Okay, and they, they need to, to function in their normal li life. They don't they want to bump into, into, into walls and they want to catch their food or get their food. And what happens when you put these prisms, is, uh, and it's happened quite fast, in a few hours, is that the barn owls, they adjust their motor system to the prisms. And this is something that is separate from what I'm telling you. It's, there's a sensory motor adaptation here. So very fast they learn that if they see something here, they want to grab it with their uh, 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 talons, they move their arm to the side. Okay? So they can correct for this. And this is another reason why you want to do this kind of adaptation. Because if you adjust everything to the visual system, okay, you see something right ahead, you move your talon right here. Okay? So you want to also, when you hear something, okay, you want to move your talon to the side when you hear something right here. Okay? So, Let's continue. So, uh, what I've shown you so far is that Eric Knudsen and his students, they found a very interesting um, system that allows us really to, 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 to identify, to look at learning and to look at very interesting learning. And so now what we can do, we can use this uh, system and try to figure out what are the mechanisms of this learning. And in order to do this, we have to go into the brain. And the way we do it is by penetrating microelectrodes, 
which you see here is an, an example. This is a microelectrode. It's this very thin metal wire. It's isolated from all the sides except to the very, very fine tip. And you can see this microelectrode is inserted into a brain tissue. And it measures the electrical field right here close to the tip. So if we lower this electrode and position it close enough to neurons that you can see here, then we can measure with this the small changes in the electrical field that are produced by these neurons firing action potentials, by these neurons responding to stimuli, to external stimuli. So we can measure how these neurons respond to external stimuli just by measuring the number of action potentials that they fire and we usually record from, we can record from one, even one neuron or a few neurons just near the tip of the electrode. Okay? And <coughs> what you see here is a lateral view, a side view of the Barnhaus brain. This is here is the forebrain, this is the cerebellum, this part here is called the tecta lobe. In humans, just a second, in humans uh, we also have a tecta lobe but it's called the superior colliculus. It's much smaller compared to the rest of the brain but we still have this very same structure. Yes? Yeah, yeah. So this is a neuron, this is a cell body, and these are the dendrites. This is another neuron. The dark spot is a neuron. Yes, and this is the electrode. We have now a large enough microscopes in resolution to see and see the neuron. Oh, yeah. We have now large enough a microscope to see a single protein now, so of course we can see a single neuron. Uh, <coughs> So, um, if we insert an electrode into this tecta lobe, what we find, we find neurons that are very interesting. They respond to sound. So every time we, we play a sound, a brief sound in the room, then they start firing action potentials. Okay? But they respond only to sounds that come from a certain position in the room. Okay? And this is illustrated by this circle here. Okay, this demonstrates just the, the environment in front of the owl. So this would be here. This would be azimuth. This would be left, right. This would be elevation, 20 degrees up, 20 degrees down. And this uh, ellipse just symbolized an area from which if you put a speaker, then this neuron that we are recording from will respond. And if you put a speaker or a sound from any other location, the neuron would not respond. Okay? So this is called the receptive field of the neuron. And now many neurons in this tecta lobe, they also respond to visual stimuli, visual signals in the room, and also they have a visual receptive field, and in most cases the visual receptive field and the auditory receptive field of single neurons, they overlap. They are in the same location in the, in the room. Now if we move this electrode, oh, before that, we can also insert earphones into the owl's ear, and then <coughs> with the earphones we can produce sounds and we can manipulate the time differences between the two ears, the ITD. Okay? So we can start from here, this is 550 microsecond left ear sound before right ear, then we, we zero, he is here, and plus 50 microsecond right ear before left ear. Okay? And for each of these different ITDs we can measure the response of the cell, that is how many spikes, how many action potentials the cell fires. This is what you see at this axis. And in most cases, we get this curve that you see here in red, which means that there is in a range of ITDs that this neuron likes to respond to, a, a, a very narrow range of ITDs. In this case, it's near zero ITD, okay? and it's not a coincidence, because this neuron has the auditory receptive field right in front, which corresponds to ITDs of zero. Now, if we move the electrode to a different position in the optic tectum, Again, we get auditory and visual receptive fields which are overlapping, but from a different location in space. And we also get this ITD tuning curve with a, a narrow range of ITDs which the neuron likes to respond to, but at a different location corresponding to the new auditory receptive field. And if we do this many, many times and we uh, uh, map the whole surface of the tecta lobe, what we discover is that there is a map of space, an auditory map of space covering the tecta lobe. That is, if the, all the cell bodies along this line 
have their auditory and visual receptive fields right in front, and all the cell bodies here have their auditory receptive fields 40 degrees to the side. These cell bodies up here have their receptive fields above, and here, down here, have their receptive fields below the horizon. Okay, so it's a map of the environment. Now, this is uh, not, not new. We, we know of many uh, brain maps. We know visual maps, we know of, of somatosensory maps, of the body maps. But here it's an auditory map, which I think is more interesting because, as I mentioned before, here to create this map, you need to compute the, this map from the signals coming to the ears. While in the visual system or the somatosystem system, it's a much more straightforward way to create a map because, as I said, the map is just built there. It's built in, in the structure of the retina or the structure of the body. So it's a very interesting uh, question how this map is created. Um, but this is just a side question, so we go back to plasticity. So now, <coughs> um, Eric Knudsen and his student uh, took advantage of this structure of the tectalogue, of the surface of the tectalogue, which is called the optic tectum. What they did, they lowered an electrode to a normal bar now, and they mapped the visual and auditory receptive field that they recorded. And as I've shown before, here are the auditory and visual receptive fields overlapping. Uh, now they put prisms. And the immediate effect of prisms is that the visual receptive field is shifted to a different position. Okay? Because it's, it's just the optical effect of the prism. If you have a neuron that is responding to a light that's coming from here, now you put the prism, you put the light here, the neuron is not responding because it's, it's, it's now, uh, the light is coming to somewhere else in the retina. It's responding to a, a stimulus from here. Okay. The auditory receptive field is not changing. It's the same thing. Now, the owls are released in their aviaries and again allowed to adapt, and the owls are brought back to the lab. This time, they are anesthetized and the electrode is again penetrated into the optic tectum to the same location as before and the auditory and visual receptive fields are mapped and what was found is quite remarkable that throughout this adaptation period the auditory receptive field and in fact all the auditory receptive fields of all the neurons in the tectal lobe gradually shifted their position okay, until they eventually overlapped again with the visual receptive fields okay? So again, we see just like in the behavior, the visual map is dominant, it's, it's stable. And the brain doesn't like the, the situation that the auditory and the visual maps do not overlap, they do not match. So the auditory map is, is plastic, it's changing until they, map, they match again. Okay. And this is the learning. And of course, this is also explains why the owl now changes its head to a different position. Okay. Because the motor system also reads out this map. And the motor system doesn't know where the stimuli are coming from. All it knows is which neurons are activated in this map. So if now an, an auditory stimulus that's right in front is activating neurons at the side of the map, then the head will move to the side as well. <coughs> okay, so this is very nice. We can actually see changes in the brain that can explain this learning, this plasticity. Okay. Now, in order to, to go further and study this, we need some mean to quantify the learning. We'll be able to tell how far did the owl learn. Did it learn well? Did it, did it not learn at all? And we can do this. We can do this in two ways. We can do it by using a behavioral test. But the behavioral test is much more uh, difficult because it takes a lot of time to train owls. So the easiest way, and the preferable way, is to do a physiological test. And basically what we do, we can lower an electrode to the optic tectum, measure the ITD tuning curve, okay? And uh, if we could do that, the ideal experiment would be to measure the ITD tuning curve before putting the prisms, which would be the black tuning curve, and then wait for prism adaptation to happen, and measure from the same neuron the ITD tuning curve after putting the prisms. Now we can measure how much these two were shifted. Okay? And, we, and this will give us an indication how much learning occurred. Okay? But this experiment we cannot do. We can never go to the same exact neurons before learning and after learning. Okay? But what we can do here, 
we can take advantage of the fact that the visual map is stable. Okay? So we can allow the bird to, to learn or to adapt and then we go with the electrode into the optic tectum. We measure the visual receptive field and the auditory receptive field. Okay? But we measure the visual receptive field without the prisms. Okay? And what we expect is that if the owl didn't learn at all, if it's a normal owl before learning or an owl that didn't learn, that they will overlap. Okay? If the owl learned, fully learned, they will be uh, separated by a distance that is equal to the distance of the prismatic shift. Okay? Or anywhere in between. Okay? So this is what we do. This is how we quantify the learning. We do it for many neurons and we average. So now I want to show you a few of the results, of the interesting results that were found out using this way. <coughs> what you see here is uh, results from one, two, three, four, five, six different barn owls. This axis shows the age of the barn owl. And this axis shows the, the shift of the auditory map, the shift of the receptive field, the auditory receptive field relative to the visual receptive field. So this is zero. This is, would be a normal owl. And this would be the maximal amount of shift that is expected due to the prisms. Okay? And what you see is that this owl, for example, the first day the prism were mounted was about uh, two weeks of age. Okay? There's no shift here. Then after um, a few weeks, we can see here the map shifted all the way here. And then wait a few more days, it shifted up here. And it continues to shift. Okay? The map gradually is moving. The learning is happening gradually. Here we take another bound owl. The prism were, put, uh, were mounted at the age of about 100 days. And you can see a nice learning curve. Also here, a nice learning curve. But when we look at this bound owl, which the prism were uh, positioned on its eyes at the age of 200 days, then we can see that the map shifts, but then stops here. It doesn't shift all the way. Okay? Here, the situation is even worse. And if we go to this panel, 400 days of age, then there's no learning at all. Okay? So we see something very interesting. Okay? There is what we call a sensitive period, or a critical period, a period um, of young age where the animal can learn much better compared to when they are adults. Okay? So now it's a question, a very interesting question. Well, can we allow, can we find some ways, some strategies to allow barn owls that are adult to adjust to the prison, to learn also? Okay? And you can understand why this can be relevant. <coughs> so, here's one strategy that proved useful. What they did in this experiment, they took three barn owls, young barn owls. The barn owls were mounted with prisms. They were allowed to shift. And you can see here, these are the, th the shifts of the maps of these three barn owls when they were young. Then the prisms were removed and the maps were shifted back to normal. Okay? When you remove the prism, the maps are shifted back to normal. That is, the learning is forgotten. Okay? But then they took these same three barn owls at an old age, when they were adults, and they put the prisms again. This is what you see here. Okay. They also took two new adult barn owls that never had a prism experience in their life, and this is these two blue curves. And what you see that those barn owls that had a previous experience with the prisms, they can adjust, they can learn as adults, while those that had no prism experience, those are the, that are naive, they never learned. The, uh, to adjust to the prisms. Okay? So this is one way to help an adult to learn. The other way is shown here. So the idea is that, well, if we take an adult barn owl and we put the prisms that are, have a large shift, let's say 23 degrees, okay, then the owls cannot adjust to it. They cannot learn. But maybe if we take a small shift of prisms, we take a, a, a shift with a small magnitude, 6 degrees, then the owl will adjust to it. And once they adjust to it, then we can take another step, 11 degrees, wait until the owl adjusts to this, and then take another step of 17 degrees, and finally reach 23 degrees. Okay, so this is called incremental learning. And here you see a result from one of these experiments. This is one barn owl, 
you can see uh, this is before mounting the prisms. Six degrees, prisms were mounted, and the owl, after 20 days, adjusts fully to the six degrees prisms. And remember, this is an adult barn owl. Then, 11, uh, six degrees prisms were removed, 11 degrees uh, prisms were uh, mounted, and the owl, after 20 days, adjusts again. So the 11 degrees prism were removed and replaced by seven degree, 17 degrees, and the owls continue adjusting its auditory map. You can see as we get further and further away with the, uh, from, from zero, then the rate of adjust is becoming slower and slower. But still, this is much better than any other adult owl. Okay. And here what you see is that after removing these prisms and allowing the owl to forget, now we put just one prism of 23 degrees to the same owl and it quite readily adjusts, quite readily learns. Okay? So it, it had a previous experiment as an adult and it still can learn. Okay? So this is strategy number two to teach adult, adults and strategy number three is shown in this experiment. Here <coughs> the barn owls were divided to two groups. One group here of five barn owls uh, all of them are adult barn owls, but this group uh, were mounted with the 23 degrees prisms and they were just raised in the normal way in the cage, that is, they are fed by dead mice. Okay? The dead mice are just thrown on the floor and they uh, collect them from the floor. And you can see that if you look at the median shift of the auditory maps of these barn owls, it's not dramatic, it's not impressive at all. Okay? As we expect, they're adults. Now, another group of three barn owls here, they were allowed to hunt live mice. Okay, so live mice was released uh, in the arena and the owls were happily hunting them and, and eating them. And these three barn owls, amazingly, um, demonstrated a much larger shift. They learned better. Okay, what you see here is another group, a third group of five barn owls. Uh, that basically, no, this is not another group, this is the same five barn owls that you see here. So after this long exposure to dead mice, then they were also released in the arena with the live mice, and immediately what happened is that their auditory map started to shift, only once they started eating life. So rich and lively experiences increase the learning capacity in adults. Okay, so to summarize this point, we've seen... Yes, they were having the prisms on their eyes and they were hunting with the prisms, okay? Okay. So, <coughs> what we see, um, we see some interesting points. First of all, we see a decline in learning with age. We see an increased capacity for learning in adults that have had appropriate experience as juveniles. We see incremental training improves learning. And we see rich and lively experiences increase learning capacity in adults. And this is very interesting because all these points immediately jump to our mind as, as uh, exactly what we know from our daily experience when we try to learn. These are all very relevant to human learning, right? We all know that there is a dramatic decline in the ability to learn with age. We all know that if we learn something uh, as, as kids, okay, even if we forgot it and we get back to it, it's much easier to learn it again. We all, uh, 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 well, there's, there are quite a few examples uh, that shows that incremental training is better for learning if you, if you divide your learning to small steps. And of course, we all know and we all feel that, that experiences that are very, very important for us, that are, are very interesting to us, that are very relevant to our, to our daily life, are much, have a much more profound effect on memory compared to experiences that are boring, that are not interesting. Okay, and this is the last point, okay? And what this tells us, in my mind, is that it, it's very likely that the, although these are very different kind of learning, that the basic mechanisms of learning are the same. And therefore, by studying learning mechanisms in such animals as the barn owls and others, we can learn very important lessons for humans. Um, 
So now this part I will skip. This is just I wanted to show you that we know where the plasticity is happening, and uh, which gives us also some, some very interesting tools to learn about mechanisms of learning. And well, I'll summarize them. Um, there are the two, two main points um, uh, that I've showed you today. Research, physiological and behavioral research in Barnhouse okay, exposes some basic uh, brain mechanisms of learning and memory, and not only learning of memory, also from uh, uh, brain computations. And the research in Barnhouse, uh, it has some, it, it, it's relevant, it has some relevance to research in human and in human medicine. Um, just to mention some more uh, recent directions of research, okay? well, most of the experiments that I've shown today are, are quite old right now, but there are more modern directions of research in the Barnhouse, uh, things that we study in our lab now and in other labs. Uh, one um, very important direction is to study the, the integration of visual and auditory signals in the barn owl's brain. This is a very hot topic in neuroscience today. There is a lot of interest now in how senses are combined in the brain. So we can use the barn owl because the barn owl, as we mentioned here, is a very good auditory system, has a good, very good visual system. It uses both for hunting and therefore the, the systems that are integrate visual and auditory uh, systems are robust, and uh, we think that it may be a good model system for understanding where this is happening in the brain, where the integration is happening in the brain, and what are the rules for integration. Another interesting direction is uh, studying attention, uh, particularly in the auditory system, but attention in general. Barnhouse, uh, what they do for survival, they sit on a branch in a dark night with just a little bit of light and a lot of sounds for the surrounding and they have to pay attention to very small target on the ground. This is important for their survival. So attention is a very important part uh, of their behavior and we want to identify mechanisms of attention. If you want to learn more about this uh, direction and these projects, you can look at my, web, at my lab webpage. And of, finally, I want to thank First of all, to Eric Knudsen, my, my mentor, which basically funded this whole field of, of plasticity research in Barnhouse. I want to uh, thank uh, my colleague Hermann Wagner uh, from Germany, which I collaborate with and also contributed some of the slides that I've shown you here. And of course, all the postdocs and doctor and, and PhD students that did this uh, great work that I've described. And all the students in, the, in my lab, past and future, these are just a few of them. And here you can see a picture of a barn owl that we illuminate with infrared light. So it's kind of, of, of spooky and interesting, but the, the, the barnals don't see infrared light, so we can look at them at, at night, at, at dark, and see their behavior. So thank you for coming, and I hope you, you enjoyed and you learned some things. <laughs> and uh, I think we have some time for questions. Yes? Yeah. Is that true? It's a visual system. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so we do that. We, 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 or, uh, this was done. Um, uh, experiments where uh, earplugs were positioned in the ears, or filters, different filters were positioned in the ear. And uh, in all these experiments, you, ne you, you never see that the visual system is, is, is shifting, it's changing. It's always the auditory system that is compensated, or the motor system. So it seems that the visual system is, is more dominant. So this is, although maybe we didn't do the right manipulation, maybe we didn't check the right conditions, but according to the evidence that we have, the visual system is, is much more dominant, much more stable compared to all the other senses. Exactly. When you plug the ear, exactly the opposite to what we have shown here. here. What, when you plug the ear, what happens is that the owl do what we expect them to do. They learn to adjust. So they turn their gaze to where the sound is after a while. The beginning they don't because they cannot um, calculate this ITD and ILD. But after they adjust, they turn their gaze to where the sound is. Yes? Um, well, it's difficult to do it in a 
a few sentences. Um, but basically, I, I try to, to highlight the important things. So basically, as I said, uh, you need to have an object that you can see it and you can uh, hear it. Okay? And, uh, and you know that they're coming from the same location. Now, when you have such an object in a normal uh, situation, then the visual input to this auditory map or this map uh, will fit the, the visual input will fit the auditory input. They will go. They will hit the same neurons. Okay, but if, for example, the, uh, something happened to the ear, or you put prisms, and then suddenly there is a mismatch. So now the neurons in the map, uh, when they face uh, such a, a, an object, the neurons that will hit will be hit by the auditory signals will be different from the neurons that will hit be hit by the visual signals. Okay. And this can be sensed, okay? because you can have a mechanism that can tell your neuron, can t if it has two inputs coming from different direction, it, it, you can have a mechanism that every time there's these two inputs coming from the same, uh, to the same neuron and they come at the same time, then this neuron with this, you can say this uh, connection will be strengthened, okay? or this neuron will be happy, and everything will be uh, strengthened. Now, if they come from different locations, then the neuron would not be happy. Okay. So what will happen is these connections will start to weaken. And these connections that adjust will start to strengthen. And by these kinds of mechanisms, you gradually get this learning. Okay. So basically what you need, you need a lot of experience. You need to experience these objects. And if it happens enough time, uh, eventually you would get a shift. Okay. So it's increasing or decreasing the synaptic... Uh... Yeah. It's the synaptic, and also there's what we call, in this system, it's very clear that there's what we call axon sprouting. So you get more connections in one direction and less connection in the other direction. Yes? Um, don't the receptor areas in the brain that deal with, uh, with auditory stimuli and, uh, and visual ones? So uh, you, say, you say that the brain likes to adjust so that the two impulses hit the same neuron, but No, no, <clears throat> you're, you're, you're partly correct and partly wrong. So in the brain, and this is a common knowledge, that uh, there's separate pathways for the auditory system and the visual system, okay? But there are also uh, these, these separate pathways, they, they communicate with each other, they interact. So there are uh, quite a few neurons that receive information both from the auditory system and from the visual system, okay? And these neurons, in, in, uh, basically, in order to have this kind of learning, you have to have such neurons. You have to have neurons that can compare between information coming from the visual system and the auditory system. And indeed, we find these neurons yeah, in the Barnard's brain. Okay, so thank you.